what was in the dark is now coming to light. It's a harsh reminder that not all who claim to walk in the light are truly guided by it. They read the word for yourself because what you heard may not match the word. Okay. You will know them by their fruit. So shh, quiet on the set. We haven't seen nothing yet. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Confidence Restored Podcast presented by CC America, also known as Confidence Centers of America and hosted by Tamaria Jordan. This is a show designed to help you build your confidence, increase your faith and get mentally fit to overcome any trials and tribulations you may encounter. Through personal testimonies of faith, inspiration, and transformation, Tamaria and guests seek to inspire and uplift you. This message is delivered by us, CCing you on lessons learned in hopes of encouraging you regardless of where you are in life. Enjoy the show. The show Quiet On Set, the dark side of kids TV has made quite a stir and rightfully so because they have jumped into the deep end and they are looking into the untold stories and the uncomfortable truths about our world. And so I happen to be up. You notice that I'm sitting on the couch. I fell asleep early and I ended up waking up in the middle of the night. And I will say that the revelation that I got, so I like to call this a couch conversation because it's real and it's relevant. So when we think about the show, Quiet On Set, if you haven't seen it, according to Google, the show is a docuseries that uncovers the toxic culture behind some of the most iconic children's shows in the late 1990s and early 2000s, many of which I can say that I watched. And from sexual predators to on-screen sexual innuendos, the show highlights a heavy topic, yet it's one we can't afford to ignore. So... I really want to talk about the complexities of belief, truth, as well as accountability in the face of such disturbing revelations. So what's fascinating about this whole thing is how people tend to react when confronted with uncomfortable truths, especially when those truths challenge their deeply held beliefs. So take, for instance, the messages uh, from those people who claim to speak on behalf of a higher power. So in this particular case, I'm talking about the prophets and prophetesses that you have been hearing. And there is this, I will say, this argument with regard to believers in Jesus Christ that they're trying to figure out who is speaking on behalf of God and who's speaking um, on behalf of themselves or maybe not sharing what they believe to be true because the Bible does warn us that in the end days that there will be a lot of false prophets. And so people are trying to figure out, well, how do I know if it's really a prophet of God or if it's, you know, that they're getting this message from another power? And so I would say the Bible tells us that you will know them by their fruit. So I say trust your gut and your intuition and pray that the Holy Spirit would give you guidance on who to trust and who to believe in these end times. But when we think about history, prophets, messengers, and visionaries have often been met with some skepticism and ridicule and sometimes even outright hostility. And I've heard some of the individuals who have been bringing forth the word of God that they feel like God has imparted in them through the gift of the Holy Spirit and showed them of the things that are to come and or revealing to them the things that have been in secret When they proclaim these things, people get upset. But when the truth they proclaim is finally revealed, there's a sudden shift in attitudes and there's collective acknowledgement that maybe they were on to something all along. And so I will say for me, and also probably for many of them, I don't I don't know what ultimately will become of me in terms of like my life and what God may have me to do. But right now I just feel like a well. And so I will say, I don't proclaim to be a prophetess. I don't claim to be a preacher. I feel like I have the gift of teaching. And so that's what I'm doing is teaching the word, but also just making people think. So I say when God gives you a download, (laughs) you feel like you're about to explode until you get it out. And so even when I think about what's happening now, 
as it relates to individuals coming forth and sharing what they believe is the word of God for such a time as this. In Ezekiel 3, it reminds us that if God gives us a warning to give to the people and we fail to do it, then their blood is on our hands. I always tell people, read the word for yourself and ask the Holy Spirit to minister to you in all spirit and in truth. But in Ezekiel 8, verses 6 through 18, King James Version, it says, He said furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw and behold, every form of creeping thing, an abominable beast, And all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand. And a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, the Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. He said also unto me, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was turned toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping at Tammuz. Then said he unto me, hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar were about five and set 20 men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east. And they worshiped the sun toward the east. Then he said unto me, hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations with it, which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. And so when I thought about that, I said, oh my gosh, because that is so powerful. And a little bit later on, I'm going to talk about the fact that we oftentimes think about sin in terms of like, we weigh it in degrees, but to God, it's all an abomination. So the things that we do in the dark, like it says in Ezekiel 8, I was like, wow, because he was showing Ezekiel the things that people were doing so that Ezekiel could cry out and share with people that the wrath of the Lord was near because they didn't want to turn away from their sin. And so as I'm sitting here on my couch, I think about the fact that I saw a movie recently and it was disturbing yet very plausible for what's happening globally today. And it was called No Escape. And it is highlighting the fact that there was a coup and this country just went into turmoil. There were murders and all types of things happening. And right now we see that this is a lived experience for so many people. And sadly, for many people, there won't be a happy ending because they may not make it to the end. They may not make it out. So when you think about life and you think about these situations, I continue to read. And so it brought me to Ezekiel 9 verses 1 through 11. And it continues on. He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice saying, cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's ink horn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub 
whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's ink corn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all of the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others, he said in mine hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, defile the house and fill the courts with the slain, go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. And it came to pass while they were slaying them. And I was left that I fell upon my face and cried and said, ah, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel and thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Then said he unto me, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. And the land is full of blood and the city full of perverseness. For they say the Lord hath forsaken the earth and the Lord seeth not. And as for me also, mine I shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. And behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the ink horn by his side, reported the matter saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. And so when I think about what's happening now, we and it talks about the mark. I think about Prophetess Tiffany Montgomery and some of the things that she's shared in her prophetic messages, and it really started to make more sense to me now. So it literally says in in this particular scripture that the person who was clothed with the linen and the writer's ink horn, so essentially the person that was sent out to see what the abominations were and to mark the people, what I found was the most interesting is that he literally went out and the people who sighed and cried for the abominations that had been done, those were the ones that God said, mark them. So essentially mark them so that they would be saved so that the things that would come to the rest of the world, uh, they would be marked because the others, because it's interesting, it says, Go ye after him through the city and smite, let not your eyes spare. And this is for the people who did not have the mark, which I found interesting. And so, and let me back it up just to make sure that it's clear. It literally says, and the glory of God of Israel was gone up from the Sherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's ink horn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others, he said in mine hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young and both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And so when we think about what's happening now, I remember Prophetess Tiffany Montgomery was saying like, whose side are you on? Are you on the side of God? or Are you on the side of man? And that the idols will fall. And actually she has a message out called Idols Will Fall. I haven't had a chance to listen to it, but I plan to listen to it. And her ministry is called Covered by God, which I think is a powerful illustration for even what I just read to you in Ezekiel 9 is that at the end of the day, God wants us all to repent and be saved. But a lot of people right now, they rather get into arguments about things that really don't matter. And God is like, I am calling you all as watchmen for this generation. And they want to argue about who's right, who's wrong, whose sin is worse or what have you. But we all have to work out our own salvation. But when I think about this, and I think about even what we see amidst this awakening, so Quiet On Set is showing exactly what happened. There's a disturbing trend that cannot be overlooked. So while many are quick to embrace the truth, so the ones who are like, hey, this is wrong, you know, 
we need to speak out against this. There are those who still choose to defend the indefensible. And ironically, when I woke up, there was a part on the show because the funny thing was I wasn't even trying to watch the show. So let me make that clear. I actually was trying to listen to Your Idols Will Fall, the prophetic message by Tiffany Montgomery. So I had clicked on that for whatever reason, it didn't work. And then my TV reset, but I ended up on quiet on set for some reason. I don't even know how it got on that channel because I don't remember falling asleep watching the ID channel, but maybe we did. I don't know. I don't recall that because the movie was, uh, the No Escape movie was on Netflix. So I'm like, all right. So it just so happened to be on a part of quiet on set where people had been writing letters on behalf of the uh, sexual predators and the molesters. And I'm like, that's interesting. Pretty much saying that they were tempted to do what they were doing and that just making all types of excuses. And so these are the people who still choose to defend the indefensible. And I feel like when we are trying to figure out what the victim did to deserve the treatment they received, I think it's it's interesting, but it reminds me of what I read in Ezekiel 9. And I wasn't even planning to read that this morning, but I said, whoa, that is a powerful revelation. Like, Whose side are we on? And will we bear the mark, the mark that will pretty much like when we think about Passover, that will allow us to be spared, whereas the other people, it says spare not because they have come into agreement with the indefensible, like with the abominations. So it brings back the story of Tamar. She was raped by her brother Amnon. Yet what's interesting about that in 2 Samuel 13 is that after he raped her, he was disgraced by her. So he wanted her. She told him, hey, we should not do this. But then after he got what he wanted, he sent her away. But think about how often this happens in life today. So in 2 Samuel 13, it says that Amnon said, and this is further down after he had said he pretty much wanted his brother's sister. It said, have out all men from me. And they went out every man from him. And when he had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said unto her, come lie with me, my sister. And she answered him, nay, my brother, do not force me for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. And I, whither shall I cause my shame to go? And as for thee, thou shalt be one of the fools in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. So she's like, hey, go talk to the king. Go talk to our father. He will not withhold me from thee. How be it he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise, be gone. And she said unto him, There is no cause. This evil in sending me away is greater than the other that thou didst to me. But he would not hearken unto her. Then he called his servant that ministered unto him and said, put now this woman out from me and bolt the door after her. And she had a garment of diverse colors upon her for with such robes were the king's daughters that were virgins apparel. Then his servant brought her out and bolted the door after her and Tamar put ashes on her head and rent her garment of diverse colors that was on her and laid her hand on her head and went on crying. And Absalom, her brother, said unto her, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? But hold now thy peace, my sister. He is thy brother. Regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. And that's 2 Samuel 13, verses 1 through 9 and 11 through 20. But when we think about what's happening, the things that are coming to light that were done in the dark, there was probably people So Absalom wanted his sister. You have to be careful who's around you. And you see me doing the air quotes here because it says the person who ministered to him. So the the man who told him how to get his sister to come into his bedroom so that he could sleep with her, he was the same one who bolted the door behind her. So he planted the seed and Absalom did the deed. Absalom raped his sister and then he got mad at his sister. So he was so in love with her until he got what he wanted. So I will tell you, check out episode 71 of the Confidence Restored podcast. It's called Point of No Return. I released it September 13th, 2022. 
And that's why I dive deeper into this topic because I was not even aware of the story. And back then I know it better now because I've read it more. But back then I was learning the story. And then once I started putting things together, I was like, well, hold up. How is it that people will get mad at you for the things that they do? So they will cause the pain. They will cause the hurt, the harm. And then all of a sudden, the victim is the one that they blame. And so that they don't carry the shame. But according to the word, it will be repaid to them. So when the word says recompense, it's going to be repaid. And you may not see it, but it will. And so we have to trust that God's word is true. So when I say this, I'm talking about the fact that individuals who have per perpetrated unspeakable acts, which we're seeing now, hiding behind the cloak of authority or piety, like many celebrities, elites, and other people we are now hearing about, what was in the dark is now coming to light. It's a harsh reminder that not all who claim to walk in the light are truly guided by it. And it really brings to mind a poignant passage from the Bible, um, another one, Luke 17, verse one through four, where Jesus warns his disciples about the inevitability of offenses, but also emphasizes the severity of causing harm, especially to the innocent. And it says, woe unto him through whom they come, talking about the offense. These words serve as a sobering reminder of the responsibility we all bear in our actions and words, especially when they impact the lives of the vulnerable. So where do we go from here? When you think about navigating this landscape of belief, truth, and accountability, perhaps the answer lies in another teaching from that same scripture, where Jesus encourages us to confront wrongdoing, to rebuke those who trespass against us, but also to offer forgiveness to those who genuinely repent. But the word does tell us forgive so that we may be forgiven. But what I learned, uh, and I'll say this morning, is that there's a part in that scripture that people leave out. So people are weaponizing the Bible right now is what I'll say. They use it for what's convenient, but they want to speak to some truths, but not all truths. And so the Bible says you will know them by their fruit. I can't stress that enough. You will know them by their fruit you will know them by their fruit. And I keep saying that because a lot of people are like, you know, how will I know? And I recorded a podcast episode on that recently as well. Like, how do you know if the person that is speaking is from God or if that person is just speaking from themselves? And I'll say this Holy Spirit will test the spirit. You will know by your spirit. If something on the inside of you tells you something's not right, trust that. Please trust that gut. Um, and then ask the Holy Spirit to show you, to give you, if there's something that God wants to correct you on, he will correct you. I've been corrected on a whole lot of stuff. And I'm not sitting here saying that I'm holier than thou, that I haven't made mistakes, that I'm perfect. None of that. Matter of fact, <laughs> I wrote a book called Salvation is the New Sexy. So it's, it's scrolling on the screen now for anyone that's watching on YouTube. And I put society encourages sin, yet salvation is where true freedom begins. And I had to learn that too, because um, like I shared in the in the most recent episode, episode 118, where I talked about the fact that we see all this destruction all around and people are like asking, where is God in all of this? And God is like, I am here, but you all have turned to your wicked ways. You all are more concerned about protecting the accused then you are the ones who've been hurt by them. And it, what's interesting is even with the proof, people will still go to bat for the person who has done whatever deed it is, which is interesting. And so I figured people would get ruffled by the title of my book, Salvation is the New Sexy, but listen to the music that we, we hear, um, that you hear on the radio, you hear on the TV. Look at the movies and the images that we see. There is so much that focuses on our physical appearance. And even for me, I struggled for years trying to fit in. And I realized that I am here to break a mold, not to fit into a box. And so when I think about going from hot girl to God's girl, it's literal, but it's also figurative. Meaning we go from wanting to be desired in this thing called life. We want attention maybe from the opposite sex. And God's like, I'm the attention that I'll give you is better than anything they can give you here on this earth. 
I'm trying to give you eternal life. But a lot of us are so focused on the short term, the here and now. And the word sexy didn't even mean sexy until around 1905 when you look up the etymology. And so that was powerful to me as well, is that we've given power to these words and connotations. And you can get a copy of this book on Amazon. Um, you can also visit Tamaria.com, where I have a list of my books that I published. But I wrote it to encourage people, especially women, to let go of society's labels because what we have learned from Quiet On Set, and I haven't watched all of them. I just saw the parts that I saw this morning, but the parts that I saw this morning were so powerful that I said, wow, this is so interesting because the sexual innuendos and the things of that nature that are that kids were doing, it was because the people in positions of power were abusing that authority. And so it was one clip that I saw where the gentleman was like, oh, yeah, I can I can get you to pretty much do anything. And I thought that was really telling of the mindset. So when we think about accountability and we think about what I mentioned about the word telling us to confront the wrongdoing, when we think about seeking truth and justice, we have to remember these timeless lessons from the word. So. When we hold ourselves and others accountable for actions, it is important that we remember that we also should protect the innocent and stand against injustice. So in Luke 17, it says, then said he unto the disciples, it is impossible, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It will be better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day and seven times in a day, turn again to thee saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Again, that's Luke 17, one through four, King James Version. What I will say is, that's the part that I have always heard. And this is why I say, read the word for yourself, because what you heard may not match the word. Okay. So let's remember that. It literally says, I always heard people say, forgive seven times seven, turn the other cheek. Yes. Those things are in the word, but it is conditional. And I appreciate the fact in Tiffany Montgomery's recent prayer calls for covered by God, she talks about the fact that Oftentimes as believers, we want to take part of the word, but we don't want to deal with the condition. And so the word does tell us in multiple scriptures to forgive so that we will be forgiven. That is true. But a lot of people try to tell folks that you cannot say anything about the sin that has been trespassed, like the offense that has come to you. But what I found powerful and almost like a sigh of relief this morning is when I read, if that brother trespassed pass against the rebuke him. So you can speak up about the offense and what's wrong. Rebuke him. It didn't say go to his neighbor. It didn't say go tell his mom. It didn't say go tell the, your person's siblings or your friends. It says rebuke him. So it means if it says, if your brother trespass against the rebuke him. So it says, go to your brother, rebuke him. You tell them like, Hey, this did not feel good. This was not right. And even when you think about Tamar and Absalom, she told her brother, this is not right. She told him before he overpowered her because he was stronger than her, but she said no. And he took that as liberty to go. But it says, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against these seven times, so if they keep on doing you dirty, and seven times in a day, return to these saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive them. So that as many times as they offend you, they should come back and be repentant and essentially saying, hey, I am wrong. Will you forgive me? And what's interesting is, again, I feel like that part is the part that's often overlooked and not shared. So that that gives people the right and the liberty to be like, hey, I did you wrong. I'm going to keep doing you wrong. And heaven forbid, if you say something about how I treat you. So when we hold people accountable, we do have to remember that there are other scriptures later on in the Bible. In Matthew, um, for instance, that says, forgive that you may be forgiven. It's in Matthew 7, if I'm not mistaken. But what they leave out oftentimes is the fact that 
even with forgiveness, that doesn't mean that you continue to stay around the bad company. Because even in Proverbs, it tells us that the bad company corrupts the good person, essentially. So I recorded a message, ironically, on my birthday last year. Um, so it's uh, it was in June 2023, but the message was called, be careful of the war so you don't become like that which you abhor. The very thing that you don't like when people do to you, if you don't forgive them, you run the risk of falling in the same sin too. So when we think about scripture, it is important that we remember these things. So shh, quiet on the set. We haven't seen nothing yet. So when we think about the word, and I'm going to go back to what the Bible says in Luke 17, but I'm going to go a little bit further, verse 20 through 31 and 33 through 37. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say to here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And he said unto the disciples, the days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the son of man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say to you, see here or see there, go not after them, nor follow them. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the part under heaven, shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the son of man be in his day. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the day of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the son of man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah, uh, Noah essentially, but it's spelled N-O-E, entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they brought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the son of man is revealed in that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night, there shall be two men in the bed. Yes, two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken, the other one left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken, the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, tither with the eagles be gathered together. So literally, it doesn't matter what we're doing. It doesn't matter where we're at. When the time comes when for God's return, there is nothing we can do to stop it. No amount of wealth, no number of bunkers, none of that can save us from what is to come. It is literally like in Romans 9, it talks about God's grace and mercy. It is literally God's grace and mercy to decide who will get to make it to the other side. And Part of how we do that is we have to be repentant. We have to truly say, you know what, God, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. And literally repentance, I say, is a daily thing at this point for me because I'm like, all right, Lord, I know I probably had a thought that wasn't right, uh, I, I, anything at this point, because the Bible tells us to fear God. And I didn't really understand, excuse me, what that meant, but now I'm starting to understand even more. Um, what that means. And it's to fear the Lord. The Bible says, don't fear the people on this earth that can kill the physical body, but cannot kill the soul. But be fearful of the one who can essentially send our soul straight to hell. And a lot of us want to, we want to make friends with the world. And God is calling us back to him at this point. He's like, okay, if you want to build your idols, you want to worship your statues, you want to do all of these things, but God is not playing. When he comes back, there will be no warning. 
So he's giving us the chance now to repent and turn back to him. He's warning us now the prophetic messages that have been coming out. And then next week you see what they pro prophesied about. And you're like, wait a minute. I remember hearing something about this because it's coming just that quick. So when I think about how deep it is, it highlights the fact that we don't know when God is coming back. So we have to be ready, like the wise and the foolish virgins, the brides. And I, I did an episode on that too, but I can't remember now which one that was. But that also was a powerful message about the fact that the wise brides, the ones who await the, when the bridegroom was coming, the wise virgins, excuse me, the wise virgins were the ones who had enough oil so that their oil would last. But the foolish ones weren't ready. So when the bridegroom returned, much like when God returns for the church, will we be ready? Because guess what? Our earthly possessions have no heavenly value. Once that settles in, it makes you realize where true freedom begins. So I'm going to say it again. Our earthly possessions have no heavenly value. Once that settles in, it makes you realize where true freedom begins. And that's why I said salvation, the freedom that comes from believing in Jesus Christ, that is the new sexy. Look, you can go get your body done. It won't matter. You can, you can have your teeth fixed. It won't matter. Now they start talking about implants to make your legs longer. It won't matter. And so before I wrap up today, I want to leave with this. I wasn't even planning to record again. That's why I said this is a couch conversation because I wasn't prepared, but I also felt led to just share and teach. And that's what I'm going to do. And I hope and pray that God will allow this message to bless you today. So when I think about sin, a lot of us focus on who did it first versus who did it worse. So it's like, you know what? Like the Bible said in Luke offenses are going to come. Like we should know that this is, this is going to come. We know that this is a guarantee. Someone is going to offend us. Someone's going to say something wrong. That's going to make us angry. And the devil's like, yes, I got them right where I want them. I want you to be mad. I want you to be angry. I want you to be upset because guess what? If you are upset, if you are angry, if you are all these things, now I have an open door to come into your life and wreak havoc. So he's like, let me let them offend you so you can get upset. Let me let them offend you so you won't forgive. Let me let them offend you so you can justify, well, I was raped. Now I can go rape someone else. Or I went through this situation. Now I have a license to go do it to someone else. So that's what I mean by who did it first versus who did it worse. So when I was thinking to myself, I actually was uh, driving to the grocery store yesterday and out of the blue, I say out of the blue, but it just popped in my head. And that's how the Holy Spirit speaks to us. A lot of times it's in our heart and in our head. So I was thinking to myself, we think about who did it first in terms of the spirit of offense, but we think about sin as well in terms of magnitude. So who did it worse? So we give ourselves a proverbial pass for misbehaving because we look at what other people do and then we make a decision about how we're going to handle and do life. And so the thing about sin is when the devil goes to God, he's not accusing them. He's accusing you. Because in Revelation 12, it says the enemy, the devil, he accuses us before God night and day. So it doesn't matter what other people have done or what they do. God wants us to focus on our own sin so that we can repent, so that we can have salvation. So again, God ain't worried about their sin. He's worried about you. You should be worried about you. And you should be worried about your sin. Again, not saying that you don't call people out when they do wrong. Because even the word in a different scripture, it says you go first to your brother, which actually aligns well with the scripture I read today. You go to your brother first. You tell them, hey, you did you did me wrong. But then it says if they don't listen, then you go get someone else from the church so that the two of you can be a witness to the, the sin or whatever the deed is. So I really hope that this message blesses you today and reminds you that you have to recognize it doesn't matter who did it first or who did it worse in the kingdom of God. What matters is that we repent and turn away from our sins. Because even for me, there were times that I was like making excuses for my decisions because of how maybe someone else treated me or what they did. That doesn't give us a license to do whatever we want to do. And so I've had to personally repent for that and be like, okay, you know what, God? It doesn't matter what someone else did. Because now 
God's going to hold me accountable for what Tamaria did, not what somebody else did to me. So if if someone's giving me attitude and I give them attitude back, guess what? Now I'm just as long as they are. The word says, don't go to, like, do not go to sleep when you're angry, essentially. Or, and it also says, you can be angry, but sin not. But oftentimes we're like, you know what? I'm mad. I'm going to do what I want to do because what you did to me and God is not pleased. And so in Philippians 2, 12, verses 13, excuse me, verse 12 to 13, it says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So it doesn't matter who did it first. It doesn't matter who did it worse. He says, work out your own salvation. And I'm like, all right, God, I got it. Like, or so I say, but I'm I'm really understanding that message more today. And so I want to leave you all with Ezekiel 11, verse 17 through 21. And it says, therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where ye have been scattered. And I will give ye, give, excuse me, give you the land of Israel and they shall come tither and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof and all of the abominations thereof from thence. And I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within you. And I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. But as for them whose heart walketh after the heart of their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense, he's going to pay it back, their way upon their own heads, saith the Lord God. So there is a cost for sin, and individuals may think they're getting away with it, but shows like Quiet On Set are bringing people out and allowing people to share their truth. So what used to be hidden is no longer hidden. And what was done in the dark is coming to light. And so God is asking us to repent. And like I said, there's plenty of things I've personally had to repent for, whether it's thoughts and or deeds, where I could make an excuse, but God knows the truth. And that goes for each of you too. So I just hope and pray that this message blessed you today. I encourage you to stay curious, stay vigilant. Don't be afraid to speak truth to power. And read your word. Read the Bible for yourself. Ask God to impart knowledge into you for what you should do. Um, Don't just take other people's words and also don't idolize other people. And I'm going to go back and listen to the message. I haven't heard it yet, but I know it's going to be a good message. Your idols will fall uh, by Prophetess Tiffany Montgomery. But I think it's probably not by mistake that I ended up going down this path of just reading the Bible. And she even says that I really appreciate the fact that she says, don't idolize me because now you're going to be in trouble with God. Like, don't put me on a pedestal. And it's true. I'm glad that I read the word first and I am definitely doing a much better job and like, let me read the word and then God will allow people like, for instance, prophetess Tiffany Montgomery or whoever else I may listen to that God has sent in this hour to warn us. I may listen to them and literally they will confirm something that the Holy Spirit has already shown me so that I know, okay, I'm on the right path. Thank you, Lord, for confirming your word. But even if he doesn't confirm it through people, he'll confirm it to you. So you don't necessarily need other people to tell you what to do, but he does send other people forward in hopes of encouraging us. But that doesn't mean to make them an idol or put them in the place of God. I'm not God. I ain't trying to be God. I look, no, definitely not it. (laughs) Get somebody else. God is God. And it's not me. And it's not the other people you see. God is God. And so I I felt led to say that. So I'm going to go ahead and say that. And um, in the words of my late great grandmother, keep on keeping on. And until next time, be blessed. 
Thank you for tuning in to another live taping of the Confidence Restored podcast by CC America. We are grateful that you tune in week after week and join us for testimonies of faith, inspiration, and transformation. Please be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe, and let others know that you are listening to the Confidence Restored podcast. You can also now buy us a coffee to show appreciation at buymeacoffee.com forward slash CC America. Until next time, be blessed.